Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're doing well. Uh, my name is Matt Steinmetz, and I'm the Patron Training and Technology Coordinator with the Lexington County Public Library System. And I'm very pleased to be here with Mary Alice Monroe. Uh, she just had a new book that came out. It's on Ocean Boulevard. Uh, I'm going to read her uh, bio for you guys really quick. And then I'm going to go through some housekeeping. Uh, Mary Alice Monroe is the New York Times bestselling author of 23 novels, including On Ocean Boulevard, which is the sixth installment of the Beach House series. Uh, more than 7.5 million copies of her books have been published worldwide, and she's earned numerous accolades and awards, including an introduction or induction into the South Carolina Academy of Authors Hall of Fame, the Southwest Florida Author of Distinction Award. Uh, the International Book Award for Green Fiction, the prestigious Southern Book Prize for Fiction. Uh, Monroe is an active conservationist and serves on the South Carolina Aquarium Board uh, Emeritus. Uh, she is uh, serves on the Leatherback Trust, the Pat Conroy Literary Center Honorary Board, uh, Friends of Coastal Carolina and Casting Carolina's Advisory Board. She's especially proud to be a 20 year plus state certified volunteer with the Island Turtle Team. Absolutely. Yep, the group that first sparked her love for loggerhead sea turtles and is the inspiration for her Beach House series. A uh, couple of housekeeping notes. I've turned everybody's camera and microphones off, um, but if you have any questions, you should see a little chat bubble on your screen. If you have a question for Ms. Monroe, you can type it in there and then I will pass it on to her. Um, yeah, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Miss Monroe. Well, hello. I'm so delighted to be here. We were talking earlier about how this is a new world for all of us to come visit by Zoom. And now all of a sudden um, I'm here, but I do hope next year I get to come to my favorite Lexington Library and see you all in person. That would be a great treat for me. Oh. Now, right. do I hear questions from you, right? Yeah. So if there's, talk a little if, bit about the book. Yeah, if you would talk about the book, that'd be great. I don't see any questions that have been submitted to me yet. Yeah, okay. so if you want to go ahead and start with the book, right. that'd be well, great. Hello. This is the beautiful, I love the cover. Let me see if I can get it so it doesn't. I love it for two reasons. Number one, I picked the cover. I found the photograph, and I'm really proud of that, because if you look at it, it's the picture of a girl um, in the car and she's got, I got that two arms up whoop, kind of feeling. And the, that's how I feel. If you've all been to the Isle of Palms and you've come from Charleston to Mount Pleasant and you go over the connector to the island and when you get to the very top, you get that peak of the, of the ocean and you're like, I see the ocean, I made it to water. And that feeling of exhilaration, and that's why I love the cover, is that two arms up excitement. And I feel that every time. And if, the, if it's really a beautiful day, the color is the sky, like the sky. But the ocean mirrors the sky. And if it's a cloudy sky, the water is more green and white capped and introspective, or it's icy and dark, or it's just, soft gray serene like with crystal and white you get a mood from the ocean when you see it from that point so i love the cover for that and it is on ocean boulevard which is one of the beach house series books it's number six it's takes place on ocean boulevard that's where the cottage is primrose cottage and if you've read all the books you know primrose cottage it's also the in this novel where a house is being built. That's almost a character in the book, this house on Ocean Boulevard. This is a part of the series, as I said, but it's also a standalone novel. If you've read the series, you know I write each book as a standalone, which means if you've never read any of the other books, that's not a problem. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's a concise novel unto itself. And this is the story of um, Kara Rutledge, who's 56 years old, and she's getting married for the second time. And at 56, she's not sure how she 
first of all, she's delighted. She never thought she'd find love again at this point in her life. So she's getting married with the, the whole plantation wedding. It's at Lowndes Grove. And I know y'all know where that is. And she's nervous. You know, I'm not, a, she's not like a, a party kind of a girl. She's much more independent yet reserved. And yet she does it because her fiance, David, wants it so much so she's going through with it and all her friends are saying you know it doesn't matter how old you are you deserve the big wedding so she's going along with it with her left foot dragging all the way through and it creates angst between her and her fiance her and her friends and within herself she also um has the daughter hope it's an adopted daughter five-year-old hope who is charming and important part of the story and I, that's all i'll say about that the other main character is Linnea, and Linnea is a 23-year-old woman, 25 in this book, I beg your pardon. At 23, she left and went to California to get a job with a startup company. She went with a, a young man she was in love with that daddy didn't want her to go, and there was all the fight. You know how it is in an old Charleston family. They don't like their girls to go far away, much less all the way to California. But she did in a great show of independence. Well, she's flying home at the opening of the book. And she's lost her job because the startup company closed. She broke up with her boyfriend and she has no job, no money. Where do you go? Home to mama and daddy. And that creates a lot of that tension between child and parent when a grown child returns home. And then another thing that happens in this story is a devastating illness hits out of the blue and it wrecks all the wedding plans are up in the air the fights begin the angst begins and once again this family has to come together to weather the weather all the ups and downs and it's what they do best there i've thrown a lot at this family over the years and in this story it i didn't realize when i wrote it that it was as timely as it would be a devastating illness has hit, uh, the pandemic has hit all of us this year, and it's thrown a lot of our plans up in the air. In my own personal life, my daughter's wedding was supposed to, we were supposed to be on our way this weekend to Costa Rica for her wedding, and canceled, you know, they can't even get to Costa Rica. And a lot of issues around people coming home who don't have jobs. I have a niece who's currently living with me because she was in the hospitality industry. There's no job. You know, most of those people don't have savings accounts and she's 30 years old and living alone with her puppy. And I said, come on, live with us. There's an extra bedroom. And I think a lot of people are doing that now with their sort of taking care of, that's what families do. And in all my novels, I write about family, especially this family, the Rutledge family. And for those of you who have read the series, and I'm so grateful if you have, I know I'm really blessed to have such a strong following for the Beach House series. This is number six, and you've watched this family for 15, 18 years. I wrote this book, I began in 1999 when I joined the Turtle Team. And all I wanted to do back then was to write a book that would bring my, an awareness to my readers about some of the situations the sea turtles were in. Back in 2000, 2002, when this was published, people weren't talking as much about the sea turtles as they are right now. Now they're iconic. But at that time, there was nothing in the sea turtle hospital. There was no sea turtle hospital, nothing in the aquarium much about turtles. And so I thought, how can I make my books a force for good? And that's when I wrote The Beach House. And I knew it was different than anything I'd written before. And I put it out there. It changed the way I wrote books. And it's the story of this iconic family, this historic, sorry, I don't know how to turn those out. Let me see if I can turn that on. This is what's great, you're in my home. It's okay, that's what happens. I have to learn to do this, but you know, this happens to me all day when I no write. <laughs> now you know what I, my life is like. Yeah. So anyway, um, in that first story, she, Kara comes home at 40. She left home at 18, but in the beach house, she comes home at 40 years of age. And it's a reconciliation with her mother. But the backdrop 
are the sea turtles, the nesting saga. And I drew my themes from that. So from 40 years old, she has grown in all the books in age as I've written another Beach House book every couple of years. So now she's 56. So we've watched her have ups and downs, the births, the deaths, struggles, the joys of this woman's life. And now at 56, 50, approaching 57, she's now becoming the matriarch of her family. It's a new role for her and for me to be able to write about it myself. Linnea was eight years old in that first book. Now she's 23. It's She's growing up and it's the next generation. Palmer, the brother, if you remember, he's a little bit... I can't remember if he's old, younger. He's two years younger. And he, I think, you know, I always get that mixed up. Like, thank God I, I read the books before I write the next one. I always make these details sure in my mind. But Palmer's her brother, and he's a recovering alcoholic. And we've seen him throughout the book deal with his alcoholism. And in this book, he slips. And I love the way Kara has his back, that the family supports him. But he, it's, it's a struggle for him. And his wife, Linnea, his wife, Julia, is beginning to get her feet again. Oh, and Flo, we all love Flo. She was such a firecracker in the first beach house. She was an independent woman, never married, turtle team leader. Well, she's in 80s now, and she has Alzheimer's. And Kara and Emmy, her best friend, who are like adopted daughters, and they have tough choices to make in this book. So this is a family story. Uh, oh, the how they deal with issues, commitment and humor and love. And I think that's what most families do. So that's the Ocean Boulevard. And I hope you enjoy it. And over everything, there will be turtles in this book. I'm back to the turtles because I actually had a lot to say about the sea turtles in this book. And whenever I have something to say about either the turtles or anything on our beach, whether it's our shorebirds or dolphins, pelicans, the water birds, any, anything that I think is really critical for you to know about our beaches, I go back to this series, to this family, to this beach. Yeah, I, I understand that there's been a pretty good breeding season this year because of um, the beaches have been less crowded, so they've had more turtles nesting. Well, you know, I'm not sure if it is because the beaches are less crowded. The beaches are pretty crowded. <laughs> they really are. And that's what I've been telling a lot of people. Earlier in the year, we've seen worldwide a definite response to um, the lack of people out there. The parks have seen a rebounding of animals coming out. The air is getting more clear, and it's been so refreshing. But the sea turtles don't really come, to, they usually start May 15th. And by then people were still coming back out to the beach. I And I think what it really is, is we are seeing an earlier season and that's climate change as a direct result of the migratory changes that are happening in many species because of global warming. And so this year, our first nest in, on the coastline was Georgia, April 25th. Now think how much earlier that is than May 15th. And we are seeing a good year so far. It's fingers crossed. We had a banner year last year. So that tells us there are more turtles out there. But I wanted to talk about how they're coming earlier. And now this is not just this year. Last year, we had early in the year before that on Isle of Palms, our first nest was April 28th. So this is the new normal for sea turtles or so it, we are beginning to record. The other thing that is really interesting that I wanted to talk about was sea turtles are reptiles. And as such, the sex of the turtles in the eggs is heat determinant, which means if there's hot sand, we have an increase of females. If there is a cooler sand, an increase of males. And in nature, that balances out. But with the increasing heat that we've had over consistently year after year after year, we are seeing, and it's recorded, we are seeing a preponderance of females. So when you have more females than males, that will have a definite impact on the species. So what that means, we don't know yet, but it is something we have observed. So I think it's interesting. And so I like to keep my readers surprised. 
That's good information. I've got a question from Nicole. She wanted to know which book in your series is your favorite or most memorable, uh, the most memorable one to write? All, well, in there's two questions, and I think it's an interesting, um, I think the most, I think actually the favorite book of the Beach House series, and I'm not just saying it, is on Ocean Boulevard, because in this book, I really brought Kara to full circle. And I've known this woman since she was 40 years old. We grew up together in a way. She's like so real to me. And where I used to love, my, my favorite character has always been Lovey because she to me is the epitome of a Southern woman. She, gentility, graciousness, um, faith. She just had it all and she loved turtles. So what, what more needs to be said? But it was Kara, the cantankerous at first, problematic, direct, honest, loyal woman who softened as the years went by. And now in this book, you see her becoming, coming into her own. She's the matriarch and she's seeing, now I have so much in my life now. How can I mentor others? And I think that's the joy of reaching a certain age, getting older and having success is to look at younger ones and saying, how can I help you have a fuller life? What can I do? And so I love this book for that reason. And I think of every book that I've ever written. I have different favorites for different reasons, but I think the one that I feel the most joy writing, having written and re still reading to this day, is a book called Second Star to the Right, which I don't know if many of my readers know about. It's uh, it's only, and you can buy it online. It's I wrote it a long time ago and I rewrote it and published it myself. It's about a 90 year old woman who lives in London who believes she's Peter Pan's Wendy. And it's that little bit of what's real, what's not. It was, and I am a James Berry, a file. I love Peter and Wendy. And anyone else who loves that book will recognize direct quotes from the book. So as a challenge and pure fun, that was that was a fun one for me. Great. And I've got another question, if that's okay. It's from yeah. Philip. Uh, Philip writes, uh, Kara is a very believable character because of her human emotions to which we can relate. David, however, is somewhat one-sided in his adoration of his family. <laughs> Kara, and, He's a hero. What yeah, a guy. Went, why, <laughs> why didn't you give him some character flaws? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I think, I don't know if you've read, um, he was sort of perfect. I kind of saw him as James Brolin, you know, Barbara Streisand's husband, that hunky white more white than gray now but just a he actually i have a lot of flaws i mean in this book on ocean boulevard he's he's kind of he's almost pushy he loves her but he's he shows his micromanaging even controlling side and i that was very tough for kara to deal with both the wedding how they dealt with the wedding even the house a little bit. So I think um, it's going to continue to be an issue between them because Kara is very strong, but more sure-footed. And he he's so successful. And I, he's, he was a successful lawyer, but now his entrepreneurial side has brought him a, a windfall of wealth. And he's just giving, he's so giving, but there's a flaw to the giving where he just is pushy about it. So uh, it's interesting. I have a, a, a son-in-law, my son-in-law-to-be, the one who's wedding, we have to rearrange. We He read my book and I was like, oh my God, I love to have male readers. And he read the book and he actually picked up on, you know, this guy is kind of a, a pushy guy, isn't he? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, yes, he is. But he's loving and there are people like that who give, 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 and it's almost annoying how they want you to take the gift and it's kind of controlling. So anyway, good question though, thank you. That's great, thanks for answering that question. I've, I've got another one if that's okay. Um, of course. Are, are you considering a number seven to continue Linnea's story? Are they already asking, they wanna know. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> 
I, you caught me. I'll tell you, um, I usually take a couple of years to write another one, at least have one standalone book between because I'm anxious to start another species. You know, I'm dying to write a book about whales. I couldn't go see the whales last winter. And I was kind of wondering what the next book would be because I'm Another species I'm interested in is fireflies, and I've been wanting to write about them for a long time. Coronavirus, I couldn't go. So I'm I'm thinking, you know, there are a lot of choices because I've done a, a lot of series. I actually want to write, and I'm, oh, I should say to this group, I was at a luncheon with y'all when I promised you, this group, that I would write another in the Low Country series. You know, that's the series that actually I designed that you do read in order as compared to the beach house and so I was actually just getting ready to write that book when I began to pay really close attention to what's happening not just to my family but to many families as a result of the pandemic and I'm not interested in the disease I, I don't think anyone wants to talk about that when this is hopefully vaccinated we're all vaccinated and it's over but I am interested in two things one is the dynamics that goes in with the family when people lose jobs, right? And when people get sick and die, and it's, it's, it's I think, very troubling, you know, to me personally, that people are dying alone in hospitals now. I find that something that as a culture here in America, we haven't had to deal with before. And also, I want the next generation to come up. I'd like to get them started. Linnea and Cooper and the young ones, little lovey, all these people coming up. And now Kara is the, the mentor, the matriarch. So I'm writing it now. And it'll be out next May. It really will. I'm having a ball. I really am. And you have, I will say, it, for me to write the next one, you have to read on Ocean Boulevard. It's based, it's, a, it's springboarded from this novel. So yes, confession time, I'm on my way. I'm writing another one. That's great. We, we appreciate it. We've got folks already saying online that they want to pre-order it right now. <laughs> oh! I am the luckiest author, really, to have people who, you know, a lot of people write a series, but this series is one of the ones that people really love. And it's a blessing as an author. You never know when you begin one that that following will be there. And I always, I sometimes think, how can they want another one? And my editor said, Mary Alice, Jan Carone in the Midford series just published 15. So keep going. <laughs> I went 15, really. So I guess I have a ways to go. But there are that's, other books I want to write. There are other books. That's great. You, you were talking about the cover a little bit um, earlier, and, and this is just a little side note that I guess in Summer's End was that that was your daughter that was in the. Yes, in the cover? yes, that was that was a funny story. I was having lunch in New York with my editor, and I was just showing. Oh, you got to see this picture my daughter just sent me, and she looked at it and said, "That's your next cover," and I went. No, she goes, yeah, it's perfect. So my daughter was pretty chuffed by that. You know, I'm the cover of the book. <laughs> so, so the question is, is, was she on the cover of this one or no? So this, this was oh, not. You, very observant. Um, it could be her. That could be Greta. She <laughs> <All is> right. <laughs> definitely could be, but no. Okay. Uh, another the novel, Swimming Lessons, um, the original hardcover, there's a little girl and that it was, it wasn't it, Greta, but it was painted by Les, um, a friend of mine. I, mean, I don't know if I can say her name, but that could have been Greta. I mean, she knew Greta, and there's that little girl ready to dive. And I love that painting, and I have it hanging in my house. Covers are very personal. That's a fun anecdote. Thanks for sharing that. Um, another question for you. Are there any other Hallmark movies that are in the works or any other? What's the next? Is oh. it next thing in the pipeline or thank you, you there's always talk we were um andy mcdowell wanted to do the continuing the you know produce and hallmark wanted to wait until the drama channel and it came and that was two years ago and so it's been two years and the drama channel is out so hopefully we will um we'll get something going and i know i'm talking to, to her now and i kind of want her to be Kara 
again. And she said, no, no, I was already the mother. And I said, but that was the first beach house. But if up in the later years, when she's in her 50s, I think she'd be great as Kara. She was Kara in my mind when I wrote the book, you know, 18, 20 years ago. So um, she's thinking about it. But there's definitely interest in that. And we're still waiting now to final word on A Low Country Christmas, which has been in the works for a while. But, you know, until they green light it, you just sit back and you don't hold your breath. But there's definite talk going on. Great. I appreciate it. That's that's thanks for sharing that, too. Um, would I, would you be willing to read from your book or share? I guess there was a poem. That you would be willing. If to you want to do the poem, I'll do the poem. And then, if, you know, I love this. Now, we were talking earlier how I don't usually um, put my poetry in any of my books. And I'm a big fan of other poets. My favorite poet is Marjorie Wentworth, who is our poet laureate for South Carolina, a brilliant poet. But, and I think when I see that, I get nervous, but I, I put this one in and I felt it so deeply and I really love it. So I read the poem. And it's the theme of the book about coming home because Linnea comes back home. And it's called Odyssey. The sea is thick and murky. Can you see me? I am propelled forward, swept in spiraling swift water. The great current carries me it rides along the coastline, swirls around the great gyre, churns past vast sargassum weed. The current snakes from south to north, a supernatural force pushing me forward, always onward. I am a loggerhead. I've journeyed far in this vast ocean, servant to my magnetic compass. Now a voice calls to me in the current. It is the voice of my ancestors, an instinct that has guided mothers generation after generation for 200 million years. I just went blank. Are you there? Everybody's here and we can see you. You're good. Oh, thank you. I, sorry for the pause. The screen went blank, so I'm no, going to be sure. All right. You're, you're fine. We see you and we, we you. hear you. I don't see you anymore, but all right, I'll keep going. So. <laughs> I heed the call. I spread my beautiful flippers as strange forces gain strength in my soul, compelling me westward. Light shimmers above, then grows dark, aqua to indigo over and over on this odyssey. Hunger gnaws at my belly as I swim through the broth of drifting plankton. I push past gangly gliding invertebrates beyond the wreckfish and sea bream that share space beneath a gilt rock laden with pink coral and bright anemones. I am riding a river of current, sliding in watery thermals, warmed by the sun, powered by the earth's rotation. I am soaring through liquid wind, returning to the beach of my birth. I am swimming, swimming, swimming home. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I love that poem. And I'm sorry for the interruption. I still don't know. So you can see me. I can see I you. Can. Try All touching right. the mouse pad or try touching one of the keys and maybe the monitor will wake back up. All right. Well, no, but I'm here. <laughs> you're still there. Good. I'm glad you're still with us. We're with you. Um, let's see. I, I had another question for you. Um, let's see. Hold on just a minute. I'm pulling it out over here to take a look at it. Um, do you have any collaboration pro or, or uh, books coming out or are you working with anybody? Ah, you know, actually, I am. I'm finish, finishing my first middle grade series. It's called The Islanders, and I'm working with Angela May. And Angela has been my assistant for going on 10 years. And we are connected at the hip. We really are. And she and I have talked for years about writing a middle grade book together. And so when I was approached to write one, uh, we already had an idea in our head. So it takes place on Deweese Island, which most of you know, right off Isle of Palms, and is successful only by boat. And once you get to the island, there are no cars, no stores or shops of any kind. And it's a shorebird, a bird sanctuary. I, I would love to live there. I really would. But 
my husband loves cars too much. So unfortunately, I just get to dream of living there. So we put these three unlikely friends on the island. One is a boy, an army brat, whose father was injured in the war. And so he has to go spend the summer with his grandmother. And he's not doing anything about that. And there's a little boy, he's African-American from Atlanta, and he's well-to-do and his family is on the island. And he's staying with his mother who's expecting a baby and was told she needed rest. And the third child is little Lovey. She's 10 or 11 years old. And we know her from my children's book. She's in the Beach House series. And she's that young girl who knows how to ride a boat, and knows all about nature, kind of a know-it-all. And the three would not normally be friends, but they're close in age and they are stuck with no internet. Worst summer ever. So now they're stuck on this island and they become friends. And they, okay, there's turtles in it, of course, but it's about how they learn to just get together in nature in the old fashioned way. And I'm all for parents turning off their the children's electronics at least for a large part of the day it doesn't i'm not saying they're evil but it just get them to read get them to write journals get them outdoors in nature and if they're bored that's a good thing i say boredom is the playpen of creativity you just things have to bubble up otherwise you're going to pop tar ball tar bubbles with your toes like we did when we were kids and i'm hoping it will inspire kids to get outside that sounds, that sounds great i'm excited I'm about that. It comes out in 2021 it's called the islanders and i'll post it on my website and my facebook page and all my social media and maybe who knows i'll come to the library to talk to the kids we love that we love to see you talk to the kids we had a question from dot she wanted to know what sparked your interest in sea turtles or have they always been a part of your life no, I didn't know much about sea turtles when I grew up. I grew up outside Chicago, and then we lived in Washington, D.C. after I got married. But we came to the Isle of Palms frequently during those 12 years that we were in D.C., and that's when we fell in love with the island. And when my husband was offered a position at MUSC, head of child psychiatry, we moved here, and the first thing we did was join the island. But my sister is a painter, and she lives in Florida, and she talked to me one day about how she was having a dinner party and she was on the beach. She lived on the beach and she described how the sea turtle came ashore and how being Floridians, they knew, um, they know about turtles in Florida. There's so many and they were mindful and quiet. And she described how the turtles had tears flowing from the eyes when she laid her eggs and the metaphor. I just went, mm -hmm, that kind of rushing of the blood and of a woman crying during labor, laying, you know, giving birth. Also the metaphor of a mother weeping for her children. That whole thing stuck with me. And I knew I had to write a book about it. So the first thing I did when I joined the Isle of, when I moved to the Isle of Palms was join the Island Turtle Team. And we were just starting the team. I'm one of the very first members and it was, such a learning curve for all of us back then. And not only were we learning madly about sea turtles and all the exciting research that was coming out, but there was a lot to protect with light ordinance. And we were all so wide-eyed and excited. It was a great time. And all of us shared that passion. And I think that passion is what came through in the books. And they're iconic for me. I, I still love the sea turtles. I was there when the sea turtles were being brought for the first time, we brought the six sea turtles to the aquarium and they didn't have a hospital, but they they did have a spare tank. So I remember the, the turtle that was, it was called Stinky actually, the first turtle. We had it in a kiddie pool and then we brought it into the aquarium and there was duct tape and the vet came and the, the we put the turtle on a cardboard box, <laughs> not, the, not the state of the art equipment they have now. And that was the beginning of the Sea Turtle Hospital. I was so inspired by that, that that's what brought me back to the series with book two, and that was Swimming Lessons. And then my daughter, a couple years later, said she finally read The Beach House. And I thought it was very nice of her. It was like maybe eight years after it came out. It was Greta, the girl on the cover. She said, Mom, 
I read the beach house. And I don't know why. She just didn't leave her husband. It was so abusive. And I realized, oh my word, there was a whole generation of young people who had no idea why a woman who lived south or abroad in 1974 would not leave her husband. That whole scandal, the whole um, possibility of losing her children, her life, their life would have been scarred. And I wrote Beach House Memories about that love story and why Lovey made the decision she did to stay in that marriage. And it, then it kept going. Uh, every time I had something to say, I would write another book. And the sea turtles have always been a part of it. Great. Thank you for that. Um, we had another question from a viewer asking about the picture that's behind you. They wanted to know what oh, is the picture of. Yeah, thank, oh, I told you before we started, people like to know what's in your office. Let me see if I can scoot over. That picture is, it's an award-winning photograph, actually. And it was someone who came to the beach for on a photo shoot, and he happened to catch me. And I was on an inventory. And that's how I look most of the time. I want you to know I I got all dressed up for y'all today. But when usually I look like that with a turtle team t-shirt on and fishing pants. And you can see that I have, and in during the inventory, I pulled out a hatchling from the nest. And when we do that, we save that little hatchling's life. And it's it's such a joy. I and mean, you never get over the thrill of finding a hatchling in the nest. Great, thanks. Uh, you called it. You said people would that <laughs> to your desk, and yeah, that's for sure. I know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we were talking a little bit earlier about the Friends Fiction Group that you got the the group of friends. Uh, yes. together. If you want to talk a little bit about that, that's a great. Um, it's been popular with uh, some of our folks here. If you want to talk about that. Oh, and I hope everyone comes. Friends and Fiction began in April. And it's a group of us who are friends, authors, and we just talked to each other about what are we going to do? Our tours were canceled. I had the paperback tour of the summer guests coming out. And Christy Woodson Harvey had her new hardcover coming out. And Mary Kay Andrews had a hardcover coming out. And then my hardcover was coming out. And Patty Henry just had um, the paperback, a special edition of of becoming Mrs. Lewis. So we were on the phone and we just had a glass of wine and we we're commiserating, you know, how are you? What are you doing in this pandemic? Uh, where are you sheltering in place? And what are we going to do? Because we're not on tour. How, what's happening in the publishing world? And the other question we asked was, what's happening to the bookstores? Because we knew we were in trouble, but we all felt the bookstores were even in more trouble because none of the authors were coming. That meant a big cut in their um, book sales. And there are, you know, it's hard business to run anyway. So we started talking and we called it Rose Wednesday. I think that was the, what we called it. And then the second week we got together and talked. And then I think it was Christy who said, why don't we take this on the road. Why don't we put it on Facebook and invite people to join in? So we did. And we started off very casual. We didn't know what we were doing. This whole Zoom thing is new for all of us. And we stumbled along and more and more people would come. And we talked about each other's books. And we said anyone who bought the books that we picked one independent bookstore to highlight to sort of give them a boost. And it turns out more and more people were coming just to sort of chat with us and listen in. And we tried to answer the questions they asked. Well, it became increasingly successful so that by two weeks ago, we said, you know, we talked about our books. Let's polish our act a little bit and invite guests. So we hired someone to actually make sure the technical difficulties were settled. And we invited guests. And my first guest was Delia Owens. And when, you know, Delia is fabulous, but she's so well known. And when she said yes, everyone started saying yes. And the best thing uh, about the whole show is these are our writer friends. So Kristen Hannah came on the first week. And I've known Kristen since we were both cutting our teeth in the industry 25, 30 years ago. And she's so dynamic and her success is skyrocketed. And she was great. So you can catch all these 
in, um, I think if you go to the Facebook page, you can still catch all these. Last week was Debbie Maycomer. She was our second guest. And again, I've known Debbie for years and it was so much fun to hear about her story and chatting, not just about her books, but her life. And the five of us asked questions. And this coming Wednesday is Lisa Wingate. And before we were years, was such a huge hit. And she was at Wild Dunes with me when I do my Wild Dunes author event. Some of you may have been to that. So it turns out that we have this blockbuster author lineup coming up, but we know them. And we have such a camaraderie between us that people are saying they're having a really good time. And it's every Wednesday night at seven o'clock. And it's on Facebook. We have our own Facebook group page. And on that group page, you're all invited to put questions that you might not have answered live because we're so limited with time. But we, we do go back to the page and we try to answer the questions. So we, people like that. They can talk about the books, they're reading. And we're trying to start actual discussions now of the author's books. So do come join us. It's Friends and Fiction on Facebook. Great. Thanks for, for sharing that as well. Another question for you. Um, do you, when you're working with your novels or, or working on your novels, do you come up with the plot first generally, or do you let the characters drive where the story goes? Um, yes, that's, I'm kind of an oddball that way. I Most people do have a story idea or, or, or some famous woman who might have lived in another time. I choose species. <laughs> I go with the animals. That's why when I say I want to get to the whales, I know it's like all my blood is bubbling saying there's a story there and you've got to figure out what it is. And I just have to get there to do the research because what I do is you choose a species and then you do an academic research. And then I go out and I talk to experts in the field, which is the most fun. I used to have a hard time getting seen, but now a lot of people in the field know who I am and know that I will write about a species in a way that they don't. They write nonfiction or magazine articles or research articles, and I write fiction. And I make the story come alive through people, through emotion. And that's something they don't do, but I'm getting the word out and they appreciate it. So I love to talk to the experts. And the third thing is I volunteer. I roll up my sleeves and I become involved with either the rehabilitation or the training or the raising of the animals, you know, like the monarch butterflies. Not only did I go to Mexico to climb the mountains and see the millions of butterflies, and this was for the butterfly's daughter, but I knew there was something missing. So I began raising monarch butterflies from the egg that I found in the milkweed in the yard. And that was what was missing. That just fed the story. And not only that, but the year the book came out is when the monarch butterfly population crashed. And I had that book there and I was giving away seeds. And I think there's something what Joseph can I say this over and over. Joseph Campbell wrote that the artists today are shamans. And it's our duty to put our ear to the ground and to be prescient, to sense what's coming. And I think that's true. So when I have an instinct that says it's time to write about this species now, or even this feeling that I have that there's something under the surface in families right now that I want to write about that's bubbling in me. So I know it must be bubbling in my readers as well. I must write that book. I'm driven to write it. So for me to answer that question, the, the spark for my novels is always a species. And then I see what comes out of that so that I can parlay that into the human story. That's my inspiration, but always the stories about the humans. That's excellent. Thanks for sharing that too. I had another question from Pat. Pat wanted to know how long have you been writing and how long did it take you to become an author? I've been writing all my life. I really have. You know, there are people who, um, like Leisha, was it who wrote Tender? Is it Tender Mercies? Uh, she anybody? She began writing at sixty. I'm sorry, I, I'm blanking on her name. Leah, it'll come to me. 
tonight when I go to sleep. It'll pop in my head. I'm sure you all realize what that's like. Um, at any rate, she became an author in her 60s for the first time. Beautiful book. Roses, something to do with roses. Oh gosh, if anyone out there knows what I'm, who I'm talking about in the title, please punch it in the chat so I can be relieved of my, my pain. I wrote ever since I was a little girl. I never didn't tell stories. My first book I wrote officially in, in lined paper with tape to make it the binding was Willie the Wishful Whale and I was eight years old. But I remember telling stories and making up stories for as long as I can remember. And I believed in fairies and elves and went into the woods and rewrote songs. It was always that storytelling. So ever since I can remember. However, my first novel was published not until I was 40. And I was put to bed. I was teaching and had a circuitous route to my career and was put to bed with my third pregnancy. And the doctor said, you can either go back to teach or you can have a baby, but you're not going to be able to do both. So I was put on bed rest for several months. And during that time, my husband, the psychiatrist, took the TV out of the room and I could have killed him because I thought, what am I going to do all these months lying in bed? I'll have reading, but a little TV would be nice. And he said, Mary Alice, for as long as I've known you, you've wanted to write a book. And you said you didn't have the time. Now you have the time. And he was absolutely right. So I had a yellow pad and a pen and I began my first book. And that book was published and I never looked back. So ever since then, I've just, the floodgates opened. And whether, I mean, I'm so grateful to my readers, but whether I ever sold another novel, I would still write. And I always say to everyone out there who has a book they're working on, you don't have to be published to be a writer. You're a writer because you write. And some published authors stop writing. And it's so sad. And I don't know if they're truly writers anymore. So it's about writing. It's about getting words on a paper in your journal or telling your life story, your memoir. For sure, your family wants to read that story. So I, I encourage everybody to write. Awesome. Uh, another question for you. So what can people do to help the turtles or to, to help the coastal environments to help keep those birds, you know, healthy and happy or to try and protect? Oh, that's a long answer. And thank you. Whoever asked that question, let me just say thank you so much. It's um, a precarious time. Let's start with the turtles. The South Carolina Aquarium is in great need of support right now. I did a big fundraiser for them when the book first came out. And for anyone who ordered a book and had a delayed delivery, I apologize for that. It was um, just the way of getting things done these days with deliveries and people on skeleton crews. But the aquarium has had their doors closed for a long time and they're open now. And it put them into a lot of hardship because all those animals still had to be fed. So you can always make a donation to your aquarium because that is where the sick sea turtles go. And we're already getting a steady stream of injured sea turtles. We've had any number with fishing hooks down their gullet that would die if it wasn't for Shane Boylan, the veterinarian, who does such a good job of getting the fish hooks out and we bring them back to health and release them. It's, it's recovery and release, that's the goal. The other thing you can do is when you're out on the beach is to just remember to leave only your footprints on the beach. You pick up maybe just one extra piece of trash you might find, even in your neighborhood. Oh, and you know, that's a major part of the book. I wanted to talk about the plastics crisis for years, but it's not touchy-feely. It's not a turtle, it's not a butterfly. How do you make people care about plastic? without sounding preachy. So I think I succeeded in this book. And I worked with Kelly Thorvalson, who used to be head of the sea turtle department at the aquarium, and now she's the director of conservation education there. And she and I were talking about the pickup and cleaning, and she has these mesh bags made for the South Carolina Aquarium. I'm looking to see if I have one. Darn it, I'm sorry, I don't, but they're online. And the mesh, because the sand has to go through, but she is 
working with communities for beach sweeps and park sweeps and highway sweeps where people get together to pick up trash. Now she's gathering information about what kind of trash to go to the source and it's a community-based action. But in my novel, I always like to look at what the individual can do. Because when I'm on tour and I, when I come speak to you, one of the things that I hear over and over again is the plastics in the ocean or just climate change is so big. What can I do is the question. What can I do? And that's when I say, light one candle. And that goes back to when my daddy, I'm one of 10 children, and he was a pediatrician. So I'm not sure to this day if he wasn't just trying to pat my head and shove me along, but I was trying to save something. And I never forget that he said, Mary Alice, don't worry about saving the world, just light one candle. And I didn't understand until I got older that what he was saying in modern parlance is think globally, but act locally. What can, don't worry about everyone else. What can you do? just yourself to make a difference. And I began a, a group on Facebook. It's on my author page, Mary Alice Monroe, but go to the group, Light One Numero One Candle. And it's, again, lots of people are joining this group and you're all welcome. And what we're trying to do is to empower each other. We put up articles that I vet. If there's anything that gets too political, I take it off, or if it's not true, I take it off. It's, it's about nature. And we tell each other where the best plastic straws or non-plastic reusable straws are. Or We had a great conversation on Pyrex versus Tupperware the other day. And it's just what you can do in your own life because fear freezes, everyone stands still. When you have action, that defines a hero in novels, but also in our personal lives. So I invite you all to come. It's a great question because even though we're talking about the pandemic so much right now, the reality is climate change is still among us and it's still heating up the sand and it's still causing an unusual number of storms this year. And a lot of water hitting our, you know, from the storms hitting our rivers and overflowing our creeks. We're having flooding, so I think it's going to be a continuing problem. So anything you can do and I can do is helping the situation. So light one candle. That's, that was great, actually. That was very enlightening. Thanks for sharing that. Um, another question for you. Um, we saw the dog in the background. <laughs> What's the name no, of the dog? It was earlier. <laughs> There, I have three dogs sleeping here. And if, if anyone watches my Facebook page, you get updates on my dogs. I have Cavalier King. Let me see if I can hold on. I'll go, just hold on. Yep. Because if you saw the floor of my office now while I've been talking to you, and this is, that is a beautiful dog. This is, my little, this is Luna. This is Luna. She's five months old, and she's in her lanky stage. Can you say hi? She's um, Gigi's daughter, and I have. She's Gigi's had a couple litters, and we're we are. Um, I I don't breed, but I have a co-breeder who's a, she has her own kennel, and she's breeding them for quality, you know, for health, not just beauty, but for the health of the dog. So I admire her. So I have three dogs. I have two Cavaliers and a Bernese mountain dog, the big girl. And I, my husband says, I'm crazy. I, I want more. I can never have enough. But like I said, I came from 10 children and I love animals. So of course I'm going to have, it. oh, here's, I don't know if you can see, can you see? She's right here. The big burner heard her name. Vega. We see the nose. <laughs> <laughs> You can hear the panting, <laughs> but she's so sweet. This She's like a little rag doll. She just cuddles up. She's really great. So I have my dogs all the time and um, they sit by my feet when I write. And you know, being a writer is kind of lonely. We are, um, I spend hours in this room. And when I'm not working on words, I'm out there on the beach working with animals. So it's my life and I take them with me and uh, it's 
I, I think anyone out there who has pets knows how rewarding it is. And I'm gonna put, I think Linnea needs a dog. I think I'm gonna have, uh, I think we'll see Luna. Luna and Linnea, how does that sound? That sounds good. I just Pat, thought of it here, so you'll all remember it. <laughs> Pat just chimed in. She wanted to let, tell, her, tell you that her Cavalier Duke says hi. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> I love that name. <laughs> right. All right, well, we only got a couple minutes left. I'm gonna turn my camera back on. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. That way people can see. You, I, I still see a blank screen. I wish okay. I could see. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So there I am. I'm I'm on the screen right now. So I'm going to wrap things up. I really appreciate you you being here with us today, um, and and for taking the time on Saturday to to talk to our our patrons. Um, oh, it's my pleasure. We've got some other programs coming up that we're going to be doing virtually at the library. We've got Tom Poland, who's a local author. He's going to be coming I in. Love Tom. He's fabulous. Yeah, he's he was awesome. one of the ones who was with Clark who went up and took that photograph. So Tom yeah. Poland, he's got, oh, he's, he's brilliant. Yeah, he's got a new book out that the USC Press uh, published about Carolina Bays. They're this really interesting land feature that's pretty unique oh. to South Carolina. So he's got that book has just come out and he's going to be talking with us in June on the 18th and July on the 13th. So if any patrons want to come to that, that would be great. And it's I'm definitely coming. I want to write that down so I don't miss it. June yeah. 18th. Yeah, June 18th at 6.30 and July 13th at 6.30. He'll be, yeah. And we're having a calligraphy demonstration that's virtual. virtual. We'll be doing that on July 13th at uh, 6 30 as well um i wanted to let everybody know i've got a list of the registrants and i don't know if you saw this but this might be a little surprise for everybody but um the first 25 lexington county residents who registered i've got a copy of um of the new mary alice monroe book on ocean boulevard that we will be giving oh, away that's wonderful that's pretty exciting yeah, Thank so we will, much. I'll be contacting each one of um, the folks who registered and, and I'll be just in contact. Make sure that you're in county and figure out a way to get the book to you. If I need to get it to your local branch so you can pick it up, I can do that for you as well. Um, do you have anything else in closing, Ms. Monroe, you'd like to share? Well, I just or? want to say, well, first of all, thank you all for inviting me. I, you, truly, Lexington is one of my favorite visits. And whenever I, I'll be back next year. We have to make it happen. We I will really make it happen, absolutely. You all have made me feel at home every time I come. We love every seeing you. Um, one more thing I wanted to post, the Friends of the Lexington um, Main Library is going to be hosting Kristen Harmel on July 20th at 6.30. So that'll be virtual as well. So if you want to attend that, it'd be great. And let me encourage everyone because Kristen's one of the uh, friends and fiction girls, and she's one of the tribe, and <laughs> she's lovely. And this book is fabulous. I wrote a quote for it or a blurb, and it's over the. I'm over the moon excited about it. You will love her and the book. Great. All right. Well, thanks again. And thanks, everybody, for attending. I'm going to go ahead and close the session out. You, you may get an email with some questions about how it went and feel free to respond. And Ms. Monroe, I'll talk to you at some point in the future. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> thanks. Bye. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, there you are. Now suddenly you're back. <laughs> yeah, OK, we'll Take see you later. Care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>